everybody. So this is Hannah Simons. She's actually the main event here. I'm just warming up. I'm Wojtek Herschel, and we're going to take you on a journey to net zero. So what is net zero? Net zero was born out of the Paris Agreement in 2015, when it was agreed that we should balance the anthropogenic emissions, i.e. man-made emissions, and removals by sinks of greenhouse gases. Now, why is this important? <clears throat> we know that in order to combat the climate change, we need to stop the increase in global temperatures well below two degrees by the end of the century. And we also know, science tells us, that even if we stop putting carbon to the atmosphere or greenhouse gases, the temperatures keep increasing for, for decades to come. That's why we need to get to net zero by around 2050. So let's see where we are on this journey. So 2015, we agreed to balance um, the emissions. 2019, one-sixth of the world's economy was covered under the net zero pledges, okay? 2021, that figure has grown to over two-thirds of the world's economy. 2022, as you can see over there, we have 90% of the world's GDP covered in one, one way or another in the um, net zero target. So far, so good. However, the devil is always in the detail. I did mention we should be aiming to get to net zero by 2050. If you look at the commitments to date, more than half of the commitments are actually targeting a date that is later than 2050. So there's a lot of work that we need to do to get us to the point that we want to be in. We cannot, talking about net zero, we cannot not talk about emissions. So very quick recap. We have three types of emissions. These are scope one, two, and three. Scope one emissions are direct emissions of a company. So these are facilities, these are buildings, these are cars. Scope two emissions are indirect emissions, which relate to the purchase of energy for heating, for cooling, etc. So far, so good. That's quite manageable. The problem is in scope three emissions, which are indirect emissions across the value chain of all companies. And specifically important for companies like you, for asset owners, like insurers, or for companies like us, for asset managers, is that within scope three, we have, um, it should be there, it's not, we have investments. So essentially the money that we put in to invest in companies, in shares, in, in, in bonds, these are what are called um, finance emissions. And for financial institutions, these are the biggest emissions that, the, 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 that these companies have. So just to give you an idea, for Schroeder's, our scope one and two emissions are equivalent to a small city in the UK. Our scope three emissions are equivalent to the country of Singapore. The difference is massive. That's why it's super important that financial institutions actually um, get involved in the net zero um, game. There's a number of um, climate terms that we can discuss. I'm just gonna um, focus on one, which I think is quite important because sometimes people use interchangeably net zero and carbon neutral. What is the difference? Well, carbon neutral means that A, we just focus on carbon. There is more greenhouse gases than just carbon. And also neutrality means that whatever we produce, we just offset by purchasing certificates. Maybe indirectly at some point in time, this will actually serve to reduce emissions, but on that day, it probably doesn't. So put another way, it's quite easy to be carbon neutral. It's not that easy to be net zero. And we should be aiming to getting to net zero. Finally, before we go to, to Hannah and to the nitty gritty of the presentation, where are we on the trajectory and, and the journey to net zero and stopping the, the increases in temperatures? So I did say we should be getting significantly below two degrees by the end of the century. At this point in time, the estimates are that we are between 1.1, 1.2 centigrade measured from the pre-industrial era. So we've already used a lot of that um, budget. The current policies, so what's actually in the law, implies that the increase in temperatures will be 2.7 degrees. So way overshooting the target. What is pledged 
i.e. Mean, what we're promising, what governments are promising that we're going to do at some point in the future, that gets us to 2.1 degrees, still way, way below, uh, sorry, above the, the target. <coughs> Important point to note here, um, COP27 started yesterday, <clears throat> and I think what we're hoping uh, what's going to happen is that we're going to get a lot more clarity around what actions will be taken going forward to actually deliver net zero. Because I think last year in Glasgow after COP26, the consensus was that the journey to, or the race to net zero is alive, but its pulse is quite weak. So a lot needs to change. With this in mind, Hannah, can you tell us how we set up and you know, trying to deliver the, the net zero plan? Thank you, Wojciech, and thank you for those introductory comments. Um, and before we start about um, talking about the journey that Schroeder's as an asset manager was going on around its journey to net zero, I think I might just pick up on the, the very final point that you uh, mentioned, which is around COP27. And as we reflected back on COP26 and our expectations going into last year's um, conference, I think we were um, quite energized that we would actually um, see greater action. Clearly that was postponed. Um, and now all the hopes are on um, the action that we're seeing in Egypt at the moment. And already, I guess, the early indications are that perhaps being too optimistic um, won't lead to good outcomes this time around. But what I, I don't think we should do, and this gets into what are the actions that asset owners and asset managers should be taking, we, we shouldn't be waiting for regulation to force us um, to act. What I think we really need to do is be very thoughtful in the way we start um, to decarbonize our portfolios. And you very kindly mentioned um, the data point about the emissions of um, Schroeder's portfolio. So that sort of Singapore versus um, the small town in, in the UK. And um, if you want the actual data point, it's on um, the slide in front of you. So our financed emissions are 6,000 times the level of our operational emissions. So any journey that Schroders or asset managers or asset owners are going on is all about actually how you decarbonize um, your, your portfolios. Clearly, the things you're doing within your operations are also important. Again, it's incredibly important that you, you walk the walk, you talk the talk. And of course, Schroders um, is doing the things you would expect. So um, we're buying renewable energy um, as the source of our energy for our offices. Um, uh, when Wojciech and I travel, um, A, first of all, travel, there's a much higher um, hurdle to allow travel, uh, and B, we are um, uh, applying offsets for that part of our um, emissions. But we have very clear goals and targets to reduce our travel emissions by 50% over the coming years. So it's incredibly important that you set both um, uh, targets across your, um, your operations and also your um, overall portfolio. Um, but let's really start getting into um, the, the meat of what we're actually doing to deliver a, 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 our net zero ambition. And if we think about the three steps, and if I might ask you to, to move on to the next slide, um, it's not just about making that, that sort of, we call it the pledge, the ambition. It must be a pledge or ambition that is backed up with very clear targets and measurement against those targets. So for Schroeder's, when we have thought about our net zero journey, our commitment to that comes in the form of um, our, our being a member of the Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative. But that is a little bit hand wavy. That's simply saying um, we will put Schroeder's on a net zero journey. What we have done to back that up is to have our targets that we've set validated by the science-based targets initiative. And if you like, that's the meat on the bone. The commitment is in itself under um, net zero asset managers. Um, also there's the net zero asset owners initiative. There's the um, initiative for insurers as well. Um, they're all broadly similar in that they simply set you on that pathway. Um, but to really be able to demonstrate 
action, um, it's really founded in the SBTI commitment that Schroders has made across both its operations and um, its investments. So our headline commitment there is that all of our um, portfolio investments will have a long-term implied temperature rating. So that's as we look at forward at all of our investments, um, they will be aligned to a 1.5 degrees world by 2040. And um, today, so we measure that today, that's our long-term ambition. Today, we're currently at um, 2.6 degrees. And um, we're gonna talk to you in a moment about what we're doing in order to, to close that gap. And um, we set out all of the actions that we're taking in something called our Climate Transition Action Plan. And um, that's available publicly on our website. And this is where we really set out all of the details um, that we are taking in order to firstly measure our portfolios, how we hold the companies that we invest in to account for their own net zero journey, and then the active solutions that we're building to deliver a net zero goal. Great, so you mentioned SBTI, your science-based based, based targets initiative. Can you go into a little bit more detail what it is and how you work with it. Of course. So I mentioned um, earlier that um, we had adopted the SBTI framework as the way in which we set our targets and <coughs> therefore measure our progress to those targets. And um, quite proud to say that today Schroders is the largest asset manager um, to have its va targets validated um, by SBTI. So why did we pick SBTI? What, what do we think um, makes it a robust framework? So first of all, it is based on science. Um, it's it's a partnership, for those of you less familiar with SBTI, it's a partnership between um, CDP, between the UN Global Compact, between the WRI, that's the World Resources um, Institute, and also the, the WWF. And essentially, that group got together to basically provide a framework to support all organizations on delivering a net zero journey. So what the framework does it provides a methodology, sector by sector. Not all sectors are currently covered. Uh, so for anyone that's going to say, but Hannah, that you, you can't really do this if you're in certain sectors yet. But um, they are going through sector by sector. As an example, um, the guidance on financial services companies was actually only published at the end of um, 2020. So it's really new and we're seeing an evolution. Now for asset owners and asset managers, you'll also be interested to know that in the guidance around um, financial services, again, not all asset classes are, are currently covered by the methodology. So when I speak to um, some insurance companies, particularly um, across Europe, that are really keen to actually um, adopt something like SBTI, they've already done a, a, a sort of look through and identified that actually only today a small portion of their portfolio holdings would be in scope. So that is a consideration. So for example, today there is no agreed methodology under SBTI to measure the financed emissions related to holdings in sovereign debt. Yeah. So again, if, if, if you as an insurer are owning lots of sovereign debt, that just simply can't be um, added into your methodology. SBTI um, uses the PCAF methodologies, and there is already a consultation um, around how um, sovereign emissions should be calculated. And I suspect that as early as next year, we'll see that being added in. So clearly, this is a, an area that's moving um, very quickly, and also probably as an indication as to why today, only around about a third of companies have adopted the SBTI framework. But we're in good company. Um, those third are certainly large cap and based in, in Europe. Um, so when we think about applicability to, um, to some of the audience, mm -hmm. um, it clearly is the area of focus. Uh, just just, just one, one, one thing on this one. Is there, uh, is there, do you think there's more similar, because obviously there, there is initiatives like Net, Asset, Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, but this is sort of you sign up to something, but is there something comparable to S SBTI or? 
that level of robustness and verification or? So I am a little bit biased, <laughs> apologies. Okay. Um, I would say there's nothing as robust and widespread. There are things like the um, the TPI, um, uh, which looks at, um, you know, the effectively um, the pathway of emissions for, for different companies, but it's very narrow and only covers a, a handful of companies. And so the SBTI has the beauty that um, you can apply the, pr the framework across mm -hmm. a much broader um, a, a range, range of companies. So, so personally, um, th this is our, you know, when Schroeder's looked at all the options, this for us was the most robust Great. and it is becoming the industry standard. Great. Okay, so we signed up, we have our targets verified. What are we doing? Okay, so three key things that we're doing. Um, and this also speaks to um, some of the challenges that, that David was just talking to. The first thing is all around um, measurement. So really understanding and being able to assess the quantum that climate risk represents in our portfolio. Um, so we've developed our own suite of tools to help us assess not only just the overall levels of emissions, but things like the risk to our portfolio companies of rising temperatures. So, for example, um, we do expect to see um, greater um, uh, introduction of carbon emissions trading schemes. And so we've developed a tool that helps our portfolio managers understand if carbon prices in the future are considerably higher, how will underlying companies be impacted? Why do we want to know that? Because then we can talk to company management about if you face this scenario, what is it that your business is doing to adapt and to manage that risk? So that's the first part, is really being able to assess and understand the risk that Schroders is facing. The second piece is how we support, how we influence companies to develop and deliver on their net zero ambition. And we're going to talk in a moment a lot more about the actual asks that we have of companies. And then the final piece is really about hearing the client voice. So for some of our clients, they want to go quicker than the journey that Schroeder's in general is going on. And so ensuring that we have developed a suite of products, a suite of solutions that proactively support um, the delivery of a net zero journey. So that's, for example, identifying companies that might be leading in the energy transition. It might be um, looking at um, renewable energy. Uh, the nature word is becoming um, far more important as well. How we balance the impact of, of climate and use our natural resources more effectively. So for our clients that are looking to go faster, if you like, it, that product innovation is also so critical. Now, when we think about the going faster, I just wanted to pause for a moment and talk about the trade-off um, between really understanding climate risk and also thinking about investment integrity. Um, we could, as, a, as an entire industry, cut our emissions in our portfolios almost overnight. So for anyone that has followed, um, signed up to, for example, a 50% emissions reduction by 2030, you can actually achieve that overnight by taking out the biggest portfolio emitters. So you can be on the right-hand side, you can be in the aggressive decarbonization camp. But the note of caution is that actually that's going to have very little impact on real world emissions. And I think collectively, actually, what we're here to do is deliver against the Paris Accord, and that's about achieving real-world emissions. So for me, yes, we can all look greener in our portfolios, but I, I do caution anyone for going too quickly. Now, the balance to that is that Wojciech already highlighted that the latest estimates suggest that given all of the, the sort of carbon that's pr previously been um, emitted, we're already at about between 1.1 and 1.2 degrees of warming compared to pre-industrial levels. So if we keep going slowly, then actually the impact that we'll face from climate risks is going to be even greater. And for any of you um, that focus on insurance around um, insuring against physical risk, so for anyone that has huge um, property portfolios uh, in coastal areas, clearly your business risk from rising sea levels will be incredibly significant. And so actually decarbonizing too slowly could be very, very costly for your bottom line. So you do need to strike a balance 
Um, and, and achieving that will be different for every one of you um, in the room because your objectives will be different, your own business profile will be different, and your desire to um, reduce the risk um, will also be different. When I think about what Schroders is doing, I think balance is actually what you're seeking. And um, so what we suggest is that actually you combine a number of elements in order to deliver that de-risking journey. Certainly, when I think about um, some of the very most egregious um, areas of um, emissions, there are elements that you probably already want to consider divestment from. For example, um, coal mining, that's an area that Schroders has specifically called out because actually the ability of coal miners to adapt their business model in a time frame consistent with the Paris Agreement is actually incredibly difficult. And therefore, you actually um, want to um, actively divest from those because the financial consequences of that will impact the long-term returns. On the right-hand side, we do think reserving some space, some capital, to proactively be able to allocate um, into those climate positive solutions um, should form part of it. But the bulk, that big blue bit in the middle, in our view, is really about engagement, ensuring that companies themselves, governments, are on that net zero trajectory. And to the very right, you'll have spotted that I've got um, a little note saying that you can use carbon offsets. <laughs> um, but that should really be as a last resort. And in fact, for those of you considering the SBTI framework, carbon offsets are not allowed um, as part of that framework. Great. And looking at this, I, I guess this is a stylized distribution, I imagine. Are you able to put percentages around what we're doing, like diverse, engaged, and positive climate? Where, where thinking about yeah. opportunities, what, what would you say? So, I know it's tough, but... Yeah. No, I think it, uh, the, the one that's easier is the divestment because I would put that at less than 1%. You are talking about really wanting every company to have the opportunity to transition. Okay. They might become an investable in the future, but right now there's very few. So that, that's a tiny portion. And um, the, the sort of positive climate solutions, I'd put that at the sort of 5 to 10% level. So you can really see that the very significant majority um, falls within the middle. So for those of you that are far more mathematical than I, our normal distribution, we are not reflecting <laughs> the, uh, the appropriate standard deviations uh, there. Good, fine. So the, the engagement seems to be the answer. That's right. So let's, let's, let's talk through that and let's, let's discuss how, what, what's the sort of engagement framework that you'd suggest for people to follow? So just to give you an idea of the scale of the engagement framework that we're putting in place, um, out to 2030, and under the SBTI framework, you have to set medium and long-term targets, and our medium target is expressed around 2030. We will be engaging with almost 1,000 companies globally on their climate um, plans. <coughs> and we have set out a very clear framework around the expectations we have of companies and being very explicit in those objectives we think will lead to better outcomes. And um, secondly, how we prioritize. You probably won't be surprised to hear that when we've prioritized, we have looked across Schroeder's holdings to identify those companies that today represent the largest emissions within our portfolio. The critical thing, though, is that if you've set those very clear expectations, you now have something to monitor against. So how are companies actually um, making progress? Um, that is important. Monitoring that progress is important for steps four and five because where we own the equity of a company, we have that voting voice as well. And this is an excellent way of signaling to company management where we don't think that enough progress is being made, or actually where we think they're doing it all right. So for example, you may be familiar with the Say on Climate Management resolutions. So this is the resolutions that have been going through at AGMs, um, where company management present their own climate transition plan, and shareholders are then given the opportunity to vote on whether or not we think this is a good enough plan. Now this year, Schroeder's was very clear in setting out its expectations of companies ahead of AGM and season. So if in the most, they would have understood, will we vote for or against your plan? Now, we've got a couple of cases that if you look at our voting records, you might raise your eyebrows and say, okay, what happened there? Um, because we voted 
for the management plan, i.e. that was a thumbs up saying, company management, you're doing the right thing. But then there was a subsequent shareholder resolution that says, we want even more action. And we voted for a couple of companies, and we voted for that shareholder resolution as well, which might appear inconsistent, but the shareholder resolution was pushing for even more. And that's what we wanted to promote, that companies themselves are on a journey. So they mustn't rest on their laurels, what they put in place today, they must keep identifying the additional actions that they seek to take. And then the final piece, voting is certainly part of an escalation strategy, um, but we have a broader escalation strategy. So where we're not seeing the action that we expect from company management, we have very clearly set out steps that we take. So it could be, for example, that we're starting off our engagement with, there might be a head of climate or a head of sustainability. If we're not seeing the action from them, we might go to board members. Um, if we're not seeing enough action, then we might use our voice through voting. And at the very last step, step nine, is actually um, uh, divesting yes. from our companies. But it's that sort of, if you like, that last resort. Yeah. So if we focus on, on, the, on the expectations, I think, because I imagine there's companies in different sectors and some sectors are more harder to abate than the others, right? How, how do we... You know, how do we set the expectations? So notwithstanding, um, there are you know, very significant differences in the um, you know, emissions from, from different um, sectors. And um, we have a very consistent framework that we um, expect from companies. And so the first thing is just, in my view, it's four simple steps. The first thing is that actual commitment. So the commitment to decarbonize um, your business in line with um, a 2050 net zero goal. Um, but again, that's just the pledging, the hand-waving. What we really want them to see is companies setting those mid and um, long-term and medium-term uh, goals that are based around science. And we expect those to cover always scope one and scope two, and then the relevant scope three um, emissions. Now, when we think about emerging markets versus um, developed markets. The time frame over which we expect companies to um, set those goals may be slightly different for an emerging market company than um, a, a European company, recognizing um, the challenges that those economies may face. So we are mindful of that. We're also mindful, of course, of the size of companies as well. And um, the third step is, okay, so you've committed, you've now um, agreed your targets, but what is the plan of action you're taking to deliver that? And then finally, we expect companies to be reporting back to publish um, performance on the goals that they've set. So hopefully you see huge consistency with actually the approach that Schroders is taking, where we think about the, the commitment, the measurement, and then the action plan. That's exactly the same framework that we ask of um, our portfolio holdings. And when we think about um, where Schroders uh, um, invest in other asset managers, where we um, select managers on behalf of our clients, so again, thinking of you as asset owners, this same framework can absolutely be adopted um, by asset owners in the asks that they have of their own investment managers. So feel free to, to use this framework when you're talking to your um, other asset managers. Cool, thank you. So let, let's talk about practicalities in that, you know, we have big insurers here who have big portfolios, hundreds of companies, different sectors, different geographies. How do you prioritize? Because you've got to start somewhere, right? It's a, re a really good question. And I mentioned, um, and again, it might already be a bit mind-boggling, the idea that by 2030, we will be engaging with um, a, 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 around about 1,000 companies um, across our investment portfolios. But what we've tried to do is um, put in place, again, a robust framework where we set um, group policies we set what we call fund priority policies, and you could read into that sort of client objectives as well. And then finally, um, the others. So let me just explain about the three levels. 
the group and priority companies are really set by recognizing across our full um, investment universe, what are the companies that represent the biggest climate risks um, to us. The fund priorities though, help us identify for different investment teams across Schroders. They themselves may have some very high emitters, but they aren't in that group-wide priority. And again, that's where we can work directly with individual clients, where they're looking at their portfolio and saying, actually, in our portfolio, our top 10 emitters are these companies, but they aren't the same as those group priorities. So let, can we also focus on those? And then finally, there's always going to be a sort of left field company um, that we think we actually can engage really effectively on, particularly when we start thinking about the, the solutions part, as opposed to necessarily being a, a heavy emitter. But there are many, many companies out there that are really part of delivering the net zero journey. And so engaging with those companies around their own product innovation is clearly critical as well. Excellent. Thank you. So I think we've got five, four minutes, five minutes to go. So um, summary, we have some time for questions. So quick summary. Um, the, the setting of that net zero journey is clearly the first step for anyone to take in terms of managing your own um, portfolio decarbonisation process. And I encourage you all um, to get on and make that first step. TCFD used to say, don't wait for perfect to publish your first TCFD report. Get on, publish it, and year on year show the progress that you're making as a company. So I'd encourage you all that if you haven't yet um, made that ambitious statement, um, you get on and do that. The second piece is really, I think, um, the, the sort of at the heart of the challenge you face, but it's also incredibly simple. As an organization, you will need to think about the balance that you want to seek in that aggressive decarbonization. So you can pat yourself on the back because you've achieved um, emissions reductions versus the, the real world emissions reductions. And again, when I think about the insurance industry, for me, it, it is those real world emissions um, reductions that you need to see for your own business. And then finally, we want this to be an incredibly inclusive experience. We want to take companies on a journey with us rather than um, divesting. So engagement for us is the core part of this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure there, there will be some question on this difficult topic. Thank you very much. Uh, Virginie Pelletier from Moody's, uh, working on climate and ESG solutions. And I have a question for you because you were speaking a lot about corporates and your participation to corporates, investment in corporates. But what about sovereign? You mentioned that there is no agreed methodology. What are you thinking of doing? Do you have a plan on that side? Are you already you know, planning anything? Thank you, a really great question. And I mentioned that um, already there's a consultation um, underway on the methodology that will be adopted um, into the SBTI framework. And within that consultation, there were two um, main approaches that were considered. So in fact, actually what we've done is built models on both bases. So as soon as the methodology is agreed, we can actually very, very quickly um, turn on, if you like, that calculation methodology. Um, we have been pushing um, through our participation in SBTI to get a conclusion on um, that consultation because the consultation actually uh, was put out into the market over a year ago. And I think many of us had expected uh, a much quicker um, conclusion. The other thing, that's just about being able to measure though. The other piece is um, actually the first chart that Wojciech showed, which is where have governments placed um, their own net zero journey? And so one of the other things that we are um, actually in the process of building out is an engagement plan with sovereigns themselves 
around that net zero commitment and just how quickly um, they will look to deliver on that ambition. Now, clearly, um, uh, engaging and negotiating with sovereigns is slightly different, I can see you nodding your head, uh, than the engagements we've been used to having um, with, uh, with, with underlying portfolio companies. Um, but actually, we're already beginning to, to see the fruits of our labor there. And so we are focusing initially on countries that are yet to make a net zero commitment or where the net zero commitment, if you like, is inconsistent with where we think they should rest. So obviously last year we were hugely supportive of India making their, their first commitment. They have a goal beyond 2050, but we think there are other countries we should be going to before we actually ask for India um, to go more quickly. Thank you. Please, question Alex. Oh, Jake, Hannah, thank you very much for that talk. It was um, excellent, very thought-provoking. Um, Hannah, you said that you felt that 90% of the work that we have to do in our investment portfolios is through engagement. And um, being able to talk to, to boards and influence through voting is obviously a, a, key, a key tool in there. Um, I work in a company where most of our investments are credit. And so they don't come with voting rights, per se. Um, and we also, um, then there are also many companies out there that are not listed. How do you think about credit particularly from an engagement perspective? And what would you suggest or what do you think the forces driving um, transition in unlisted companies will be? Um, so on the credit side, uh, I think a, an incredibly valid question. Um, and for those of you that, that don't know Schroeder's as, as well, um, we are la both large equity and um, credit um, holders. And whilst engagement with um, organizations where you own the debt is certainly different to the engagements that you have um, with a, 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 an equity um, investment. I think it's fair to say that actually over the last five years, we have developed a very clear um, engagement program for our credit holdings. Now for many large companies, large listed, we do actually own equity as well, which makes it a slightly different conversation. Um, but in terms of on the credit side, actually many of the companies that we only own their debt, um, we have very proactive conversations. So whilst we already own a piece of debt, it may result in us, again, withdrawing that investment if we aren't seeing the progress we're making. But critically, in most cases, that company wants us to commit to, to future debt raising. And so actually being part of a very active engagement program um, will facilitate um, that through time. So our experience has actually been incredibly positive. Um, now, your second question was on... Unlisted. On unlisted. Um, interestingly, um, if I had colleagues from our um, private equity side of the business, they would highlight that actually engagement can be even um, more successful in, in private companies because of, A, the, um, the actual controlling ownership that a, a private owner may have, um, but also actually our ability to, to really drive change um, in the innovation space. Uh, so for us, where we are pri where we're investing privately directly, I think we have an even greater ability um, to influence. And then where we um, do indirect through a, for example, a fund to fund structure, Again, really understanding what it is that the, the management level is doing in order to understand the risks that are posed within all of their investee companies. So, so where we direct own, I think we actually have even greater ability to influence. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.